Hello and welcome to this edition of Middle East Matters. I'm Haxi Myers-Belkin. Coming up in today's show... After eight years of civil war, many Syrian refugees feel there's little point in returning to the once rebel-held neighbourhoods the regime is determined to tear down and rebuild. Seeking election in a ghost town, we meet the Turkish candidates for local government in Jabakir, the site of clashes between Kurdish rebels and Turkish soldiers in recent years. And we're halfway through our animated Flavors of Iraq series. Franco-Iranian journalist Farhat Alani takes us back to a chaotic 1995 border crossing from Jordan into Iraq with his family. Syria's civil war may now be winding down, but many Syrian refugees are wary about returning to what remains of their homes. Last year, the regime of President Bashar al-Assad passed a bill known as Law 10, which in essence allows the government to forcefully remove residents from neighbourhoods once controlled by anti-Assad rebels. Just a few kilometres on the other side of the Syrian border, families who fled the war have set up camp in Lebanon, makeshift tents that have become their new home. This is my tent. I've been living here with my two children since 2015. My husband disappeared after he was arrested in Syria. Back home, Hulud and her family lived in the suburbs of Damascus. This is my house. There are three floors, but it's in ruins now. For years, her neighborhood was in the hands of the rebels, and the Syrian government suspects residents of siding with the opposition forces. If I go back, they'll probably arrest me and throw me in jail. But if I stay here, then I risk losing my home. Either way, it's a tough decision to make. Many people living in the camp see this as a strategy set up by authorities to stop people who'd sided with the rebels from returning to Syria. And experts say the government is acting within the law. In April 2018, Parliament introduced Law 10, allowing authorities to rebuild neighbourhoods that have been destroyed in the conflict. Residents are given one year to reclaim their home. Past this deadline, their houses are seized by the government without any compensation. An organized purge, according to this NGO. In, in a bit over a year, the entire neighborhood has been demolished. This is what it looks like before, and this is what it looks like now. The Syrian armed forces retook control of this neighborhood in July 2017. The buildings in red have since been torn down, claiming to be destroying tunnels and blowing up landmines. The large clouds of smoke suggest otherwise. What we can definitely tell is that it's leaving a large segment of the population that was previously affiliated with the opposition without any shelter, without providing them with compensation and essentially sending them a very strong message that they shouldn't even attempt to return. A message that hasn't fallen on deaf ears. These refugees have lost all hope of returning home. This is all that's left of my house. The Syrian army demolished everything. By doing this, the regime can take control of the land and the houses. In my town, they destroyed almost everything and are building new flats for new owners. The men are afraid they'll be imprisoned or forced to join the army if they return. Many of them stay behind as their family try to reclaim their homes. Several countries, including in Europe, have condemned Law 10, calling it a political maneuver. The law is discouraging millions of displaced Syrians from returning home. In southeastern Turkey, candidates are gearing up for local elections at the end of March. But for some, traditional door-to-door -door canvassing is proving futile. Would-be voters simply aren't home. Many of them have fled ongoing clashes between Kurdish rebels and the Turkish army. Mehmet's neighbourhood has been barricaded off by the Turkish government since 2015. 
but it's where he's running in the local elections. Like six other districts in Kurdish majority Diyarbakir, in the southeast of the country, Fatih Pasa is a ghost town. 4,000 people are still registered as voters here, even though its inhabitants fled after heavy clashes between Kurdish rebels and Turkish soldiers. These days, I go from house to house, looking for the constituents. My friends help me. We are doing all we can to find their new houses. Most of them are living in bad conditions and talk to us about that. Despite no longer living in the neighborhood, people are still registered here so as to not lose state benefits or compensation for damaged housing. They hope their displacement is temporary, but that's far from being guaranteed. Because we haven't got a neighborhood anymore, we can't say anything. We can't save our houses. The state has seized them and forbid us from going there. We are asking our politicians to help us go back and build up our neighborhoods and live in peace. A fragile ceasefire between the Turkish military and the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party collapsed in 2015, and many of Diyarbakir's historic districts were destroyed in the ensuing violence. Metin is also running for Muhtar, or village chief. He's campaigning in nearby towns, hoping to canvass the constituents of his ghost town. But he feels he can offer little hope to voters. I can't promise anything. This neighborhood simply doesn't exist anymore. If there was a neighborhood, there'd be roads to walk on, people to meet, problems to solve. There's so much to do, but there's just no neighborhood here. What can we do? Elections will take place on the 31st of March. Those who are registered here will vote for their representatives. But once elected, even the Muqtas won't be able to return home. Five years after coming to power, Iran's president has made his first official trip to historic foe and neighbor Iraq. Hassan Rouhani's hopes of deepening political and economic ties between the two countries come as reinstated U.S. sanctions against Tehran continue to bite. Laurent Berstecher takes a look. Hoping to strengthen diplomatic and economic ties, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani arrived in Baghdad Monday for his first official visit to Iraq. A message to Washington that Tehran will continue to develop regional partnerships in the face of U.S. sanctions. I would like to express my gratitude to the Iraqi government and the Iraqi people for their rejection of the unfair and illegal sanctions against the Iranian people. Iran already has extensive economic ties with Iraq which buys gas, processed oil and electricity from the Islamic Republic. Yet Rouhani recently said he wanted to increase trade between the two countries from 12 to 20 billion dollars annually. A series of agreements in energy, transport, agriculture, industry and health are expected to be signed during the three-day visit. Iranian officials are also likely to seek political guarantees from their Iraqi counterparts Tehran already possesses significant leverage over its neighbor, having helped create and train the popular mobilization forces, Shiite militias that fought against the Islamic State group in Iraq and that largely remain loyal to Iran. Last year's parliamentary elections, in which parties with ties to these militias grabbed a significant number of seats, were widely seen as a win for Tehran and a setback for Washington. And with the return of U.S. sanctions severely impacting its economy in recent months, Iran is now more than ever on the lookout for loyal and dependable allies in the region. It's time now to take a look at the 10th installment of Flavors of Iraq, an animated TV series by Franco-Iraqi journalist Farhat Alani, in which he shares his take on the key moments that have shaped the country. It's 1995, and due to international sanctions following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, there are no direct flights to Baghdad. The young Farhat's family has to fly to Jordan and then drive to Iraq. Getting through the border is no mean feat. 
It was the summer of 1995, and we were returning to Iraq for the holidays. But ever since the beginning of the embargo four years earlier, there were no direct flights. To enter the country, we had to land in Amman, Jordan, a 10-hour drive through the desert. About halfway was Tribil, a town at the border. The Iraqi soldiers were nervous, threatening, belligerent. Earlier in the day, they had caught a man trying to smuggle a gun hidden under a mountain of dates in the back of his truck. The intelligence officers were taking apart almost every vehicle. Although Saddam had allowed his former opponents to return home, my father was uncomfortable with regime officials. So was I. We had come from France, and it hadn't gone unnoticed. We were asked to follow one of the officers. Our car was going to be searched. The waiting game began. Unknowingly, I made a serious mistake. The officer screamed at me. He ordered me to stand up. The sole of my shoe was pointed toward his face, an insult in Iraq. My mother pleaded, he's only 15. The officer directed his anger at my father. He began questioning him. I was scared stiff. What if he was sent back to jail because of me? It was humiliating, demeaning, a taste of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. 12 hours later, our passports were finally stamped. Outside, it was 50 degrees. We still had a five-hour drive to our destination. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Middle East Matters. Thank you very much for watching and see you again next week.